Hey everyone, how are you doing? I pray it's good, especially as you begin this new week. I pray that you had a blessed weekend. I have to apologize for not being there this Sunday. Um, after all these months, my wife and I needed some serious uh, grandparent time with our kids down in California, so we flew down there for a few days to spend some time with them. Got back Saturday night, here it is Sunday, and um, uh, starting to get ready for the new week. Lots of things to catch up on. In fact, I've been working in the yard, just got out of the shower. That's why my hair has this wavy look to it. Anyway, uh, in all seriousness, though, as we start this new week, I've been thinking a lot about uh, some things that um, could help us all as we go through this week. And one of the things that's been in my mind is a term we call a defining moment. And as you understand, I, I think that a defining moment is usually referring to some decision or some point in your life journey where you have a crossroad or many times maybe you have multiple options and you choose one and that one direction that you choose will really define the trajectory of your life. Now, some people worry about those moments when you come to choices or crossroads in the road, and they worry about them a little bit too much because the thing is that if I make the wrong choice and I realize I made the wrong choice, uh, very often I can undo that. And I've even found when I've made commitments that I can't undo, I mean, the kind of things that the pro Psalm speaks about, it says, blessed is a man who swears to his own hurt and doesn't change. In other words, you've given your word to do something and now you're sitting back and going, why did I commit to do that? Rather than break your word, I found that I just go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I, I vowed foolishly, I made a commitment, and I ask you to forgive me. Either miraculously give me the grace to go through this or somehow intervene and deliver me from the situation. What I found is that God almost always gets me out of a situation that I don't change my mind, I don't break my promise, but the other person decides, hey, this isn't going to work out, we can't do it. And so, you know, I got to admit, I kind of say, oh, I'm sorry, that's too bad. But in my heart, I'm rejoicing, not only because God has let me out of something I shouldn't have done, because, but also because I don't want to be doing something that's outside of his perfect will for my life. Now, some people have discussions. They say, is there such a thing as God's perfect will? And, and they say, isn't there also God's permissive will? And, and I believe both are true. I just don't know how you separate them. Uh, am I, do I have the ability? Is it permissible in the sense that I have the free will to violate the will of God anytime I choose? Well, I think that's obvious. I think many of us make choices like that all the time that we look back and say that wasn't a good call. Yet at the same time, we have a God who says to us in Romans 8, 28, that he causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. We're following his will, in other words. Well, that's the whole point is that when I realize I'm outside of God's will, all I've got to do is just simply say, God, forgive me for what I've done. And I, I surrender myself, I yield myself, I humble myself in front of you and just ask that you would take control of the direction of my life and that you would direct me according to your will. And so, yeah, God does allow us to go our own way, but at the same time, he is open and willing to fix any situation that we've made a wrong decision in and put us on a right path. Now, there are those times where God doesn't fix it as fast as I want it fixed. And that's often because that's a teaching moment in my life. And teaching moments are just as important as defining moments, maybe in some ways more, because when we make wrong decisions, God will allow certain what we call the natural consequences of that decision play out. In other words, if you have a problem of always driving recklessly and then you get pulled over and cited for it, well, uh, God is at that moment teaching you at that that it's going to be costly. And when you find the fine that you have to pay, um, you learn from that experience, and I speak from personal experience when I say that. But what I want to talk about defining moments, I think I'd like to try to develop throughout this week, is uh, how those things played out in the life of the prophet Elijah. Uh, Elijah is, is one of the major prophets of the Old Testament. He isn't a written prophet. We call him a sign prophet. In other words, he did signs, wonders, and miracles. In fact, the Old Testament records eight different miracles that he performed in his lifetime. And, and for the most part, they were hugely dramatic. I mean, he prayed and it didn't rain for three years in the land of 
Israel was almost destroyed and driven into famine because there was no rain, the crops didn't grow. And when he prayed again, the rain began to come back and the land was restored. And, and also this is the prophet who uh, called fire down from heaven and destroy and consumed the altar that he had built, leading to the really the destruction of the prophets of Baal. So he, he's a sign prophet. He, he didn't ever write anything. We have nothing written down. And yet he had some of the most profound moments in the Old Testament. And I've always found a lot of instruction and encouragement and, and even clarity as I've read through his word. Uh, I read through his story. So if you want to read ahead in, in preparation for what we're going to talk about the rest of the week, you can start at 1 Kings chapter 17 and read on through to the end to verse, chapter 22. That's only six chapters. It's not a lot to cover and you can read them day by day as we go through them. But they're really insightful, and I, I often encourage people to read it before we talk about it because you'll see that things will begin to clip in your mind. In fact, I always uh, take my, my marker pen. I have a pen that has three different colors in it along with a pencil, and I, you know, I use different colors, and I note things, and I mark it in my Bible so they're easy for me to reference. And I find that by underlining and focusing on particular passages, they really begin to uh, kind of plant themselves in my mind, and it's a little bit more difficult for me to forget them. But one of the things I want to just talk about before we even get into that is why uh, it's so important to really prepare in advance for defining moments, because the fact of the matter is you're rarely going to see them before they come, and secondly, you'll often find that they pass before you realize it, and you realize you can look back in the rearview mirror and saying that was a defining moment, whether it's a positive or a negative in your life. It's defining moments are really something that we grasp through hindsight rather than foresight, and yet they're the things that really anchor us in the sense that. God has a hand and, and a controlling hand in the events of our life. We're not just, you know, tumbling down the hill. We're not caroming against the, the things that we come in touch with in life and who knows where it's going to go. Uh, for the person who doesn't know God, that's what life looks like. It looks like this chaotic collision of unconnected or disconnected events, and we can only hope that the best will turn out. But for us, we know that our God has a plan, that there's something going on, and that he has a special purpose for my life. And that's why one of the things I, I often like to say is that there are, are three things that, that we can do every morning when we start off. And I, I call them condition, position, and disposition. And what do I mean by that? Well, every morning, as I've told you many times, I always start by reading the Bible. I read four chapters in the Old Testament and one in the New. Sometimes I'll throw in Proverbs. I've spent a lot of times where I've read through the entire book of Proverbs repeatedly uh, for six or eight months at a time. But my whole point is that when I spend that time in the Word, what it does is it conditions my mind. And what do I mean by that? It causes me to start thinking like God thinks. And not that I'm saying that I have God's mind, and yet I do have the mind of Christ, and that mind is developed and stimulated by what I see in God's Word. He teaches me, and, and I begin to condition my mind to think in God's patterns, not in the pattern of the world around me or even in my own disposition. And what that happens is my mind comes into agreement with God's will. I come to understand his heart. Then the position of my heart changes. And I find that my heart is, is in a position of grace. It's a position of faith. It's in a position of confidence. It's a, in a position that's ready to see the power of God and the miraculous of God manifest itself in the events that I'm going to uh, face during that day. And as a consequence, when I set out on, to, on the tasks that are before me, whether it's going to work or it's going to the store or uh, going to school, I find that my disposition is different. Instead of being harried and, and troubled or stressed and all those kind of things that, that are so much part of the modern lifestyle, I find myself having a peace that in Philippians, Paul defined it as a peace that passes all understanding. In other words, it's a peace that I have in spite of my circumstances, not because of my circumstances. It's really a peace that produces joy as opposed to another kind of peace that produces happiness. The peace that we have when we're happy, and it is a true peace, is a circumstantial peace. I mean, when things are going the way I want them to go, then I feel good. My happenstance is good. That's where we get our word happy. I'm, I'm pleased with my happenstance. 
But joy is, is much more uh, stable and secure than that. Joy is a sense of peace that we have, even though the things around us may not be happy. The things around us may might not be joyful, but there's a security that I have that God is in control of the events that are transpiring in my life. So I'm going to stop here, but uh, it's good to be back with you this morning, and I just pray that this will help you to set the right condition, position, and disposition for your day. God bless you, and go in Jesus' name.